prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I uh, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now this is 1 Corinthians 13. We often think of this as the love chapter. It's often cited in marriages, but I was discussing this passage with someone um, during the in a context of uh, the topic of cessationism. In other words, did after the days of the apostles ended, did God quit doing miracles, signs, wonders, prophecies, tongues, etc.? Did the supernatural like gifts aside from conversion, did those cease? And the person I was talking to decided to cite verse 8 prophecies, they will pass away. By the way, Whatever your stance on the gifts and all that, just know that this is a promise. So these things are going to happen sometime. Um, but the question is when. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Now, the person I was talking to only cited two of those three that I just read. Prophecies, tongues, but he did not cite knowledge. And here's the, here's the thing. I want to know what exactly Paul is talking about. Let's move past the idea of cessationism in this text. What is it Paul is talking about? Um, and he's basically saying this, um, that, um, well, in the context of cessationism, one more time, they believe the Bible is the perfect. But here's the problem. Paul describes perfection as being a perfect knowledge. And so he says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then a face to face. Now I know, same word there, I know in part, as verse 8, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So the question is, yes, we have the Bible. I would say this is the greatest revelation of God to man, it is the 66 books of the Old and New Testament. I won't contest that someone should somehow uh, move past the text of the Bible as their ultimate source of revelation. Um, but the question is, um, is the Bible the perfect? Is the Bible this uh, thing that Paul describes uh, in uh, verse uh, uh, 10? When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So. Um, these people contend that prophecies have passed, tongues have passed, because the vast majority of people who claim to have prophecy and claim to have tongues are a little bit spurious in terms of their doctrine and life. Uh, so they contend that these things are past. But the problem is that knowledge also is said to pass. So Paul says in verse 12 that this knowledge will be a full knowledge. Um and uh it, so basically i want to know what does paul mean when he says knowledge is going to pass away because most of these people are very into books that are cessationist they they love to read they love to write they love to publish they love to send their young men to seminary so that they can become good cessationists uh, that uh can uh you know rightly divide the word and all that um, but it seems that what Paul is describing there is that every division between us and God fades away. You, you see, um, God describes his relationship with his people, both in the old covenant and the new, as a marriage. But the problem in every sort of marriage, including in the new covenant and the old covenant, is that in every marriage there are two individuals even though we say that these are one flesh, and, and in a very deep way, it is true. It's a very real thing. It's not like a made-up thing. But in, in another sense, there's still two individuals with two different identities and different uh, wills and different goals and desires. And, and, and so 
even when a husband and wife are a great pair and a great couple and they work together well, there is still this grind, right? There's still this, this uh, conflict that happens even in marriages that are 40 years old and they know each other like the back of their hand. There's still a little bit of discord. But I believe Paul there is describing the the breaking of that even even the closest marriage between a husband and wife at its perfection is not as close to the perfection that Paul is describing there. And I believe Paul is describing when the church is perfected, you it's it's like you don't think about yourself as, oh, I learned something new about myself today. You don't think it that way that often as though like you were a student of yourself, always having to learn some new fact about yourself, right? Because you don't think of yourself as something else than yourself. And so in a marriage relationship, you think of your spouse as something other than yourself most of the time, even though you're very close and all of that. But I believe Paul intends or Paul speaking by the spirit is telling us that some day, uh, some coming day, those who are the true church of Jesus Christ will find themselves completely just like their idea of self and the idea of Jesus are just so intertwined that the idea of sinning against Jesus is just going to be ridiculous because the union with Christ that Paul just harps on over and over again through every single one of his letters becomes uh, experientially perfected. And that's going to be pretty sweet. I mean, it's not as though God just has to break your will in eternity to keep you from sinning. No, no, no. You become so engrafted into him that it's like, it would be like my fingernail deciding that it wants to rebel against me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a silly thing. It doesn't have its own will. It doesn't have its own desires. It's a part of me. It's simply, it's an extension of me. And that I believe is the direction that God in eternity is bringing the true church. Now, the visible church that doesn't actually like following God, but just likes religious things. Now, that's that's a tall order for those folk. Because number one, in some sense, they're really not in Christ, even as they love going to church. Uh, They're really into religious things for any number of reasons, power, money, prestige, uh, tradition, whatever they're, they're the thing that gets them to feel good about themselves without actually following God and his commands. That's what they're in it for. But the true church is headed in the direction Paul is describing there. You won't need to say, thus says the Lord, because the Lord's nearness will be so close that it's like... Why would I need to declare on behalf of the Lord like the Lord is here? You know what I mean? Or, um, you know, what do I need to speak in some other tongue as though like I need to communicate one party to another? Like anything that's in Christ has already got the message, right? It's like I don't need to like think about, all right, like, all right, I need right hand and left hand to be on the same page as I get up and get a cup of water. Like I don't have to coordinate that. I don't have to think real hard about that. It's just natural. It's just smooth. It's 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 just simple. And that is the kind of direction that that the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul there in 1 Corinthians 13 is taking us. Now, going back to the the whole cessationist thing, I respect people who want to exalt the Bible. I respect people who want the Bible to be the the highest authority and all of that but for people who give lip service to bible 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 all day long let's still make sure that we're not making our own heartstrings causing our interpretation of the word to become um in the way of seeing a text so for instance there's not a great argument to be able to say that this text is talking about cessationism because if if what i'm describing as the fulfillment of this is the case it doesn't mean cessationism right it doesn't mean that because if you're an extension of jesus at a very hyper like acute level 
Like if if you are basically like fingernail of Jesus, have no mind except the mind of Christ, then it doesn't mean that there's no miracles, there's no signs of you know what I mean? It's like it's more likely that there would be those things. Now, prophecy again, prophecy kind of has this sense of um, there is someone with a very acute sense of God. And so he's speaking to the people who lack an acute sense of God. Like that's the whole point of prophecy. It's like I, prophet person, speak on behalf of God to you who need to hear from God. But it's like if we're all like if we're such if we're so like indistinguishable from the body of Christ that, you know, I don't, I don't need to shout, all right, finger do this. Like, I don't, you don't need that micromanaging kind of thing. In some sense, prophecy is micromanaging, right? It's like trying to send a verbal signal to something so that they can will to do what you want them to will. But if it's, if you're just a member of Christ, you don't need that kind of mic. You don't need verbal engagement on that level, right? It's just God wills in it and it's done. So that's that's my argument for 1 Corinthians 13, both in this aspect that 1 Corinthians 13 appears to be some kind of mysterious um, fulfillment of Paul's seed it's like it's like paul's idea of union with christ as a seed and first corinthians 13 is just like a photograph of one side of what it looks like for that to be perfected for that to be 100 percent fulfilled so i i think it's pretty cool um and all this came about because i was in a little little bit of a debate with someone on a text so it made me see um just one further aspect of the beauty of union with Christ. And I, I have another, if you if you want to dive more into the doctrine of union with Christ, first read the Bible. I mean, just pick any letter that Paul wrote and it's all, it's, it's all over. I mean, it's like almost the only thing he talks about, right? Um, and then the other aspect is, uh, you know, just, uh, I've got a video on it. You can watch it, but, um, but yeah. I think better than learning facts about union with Christ is living it. And I'm really scared for people who, um, I don't know, that are, are like learning the ropes at this point. Like it's pretty late in the game, I think, as far as the last days go to start learning the ropes. I, I maybe would issue one exception, and that would be if you're Jewish. And you're just coming into the faith now. I think there's probably a lot more room for folks like that in this season, given Romans 11. All right, that's my word for the day. Thanks for your time.